we've talked about being free from fear and, and free from uh, financial bondage and, and free from past mistakes and all the different areas of freedom. We're going to talk today about being free from footholds, free from footholds. We've been uh, studying the life of David as we've made our way through this, uh, but uh, we are excited to announce that starting two weeks from this Wednesday, uh, Dr. Myers is going to be teaching a class on Wednesday nights that is titled Freedom Within, Freedom Within. How many of you know a lot of times we're in bondage to things we can't even identify? So we're going to talk about that with Dr. Myers. That'll start two weeks from this Wednesday, uh, Freedom Within. And uh, that'll be in our cafe. And that'll happen simultaneously with the other classes that we have going, Free From uh, Deadly Habits and Addictions, which continues on Wednesday nights with Brother and Sister uh, Blackman, Brother and Sister Scott. That's in our multi-purpose room. And then we're going to be adding this Freedom Within uh, with Dr. Myers. And all that will be uh, on Wednesday nights uh, starting in two weeks with uh, Dr. Myers' class, Freedom Within. But I want to talk to you today. We have been studying uh, the life of David, and uh, I want to turn your attention to 1 Samuel 25, 30, because I want to talk about this freedom from footholds. This is part of uh, one of the uh, sort of emphasis of this uh, freedom that we talked about in our vision casting sermon in January. But I want to try to address this this morning, freedom from footholds. 1 Samuel 25, 30, and it came... And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord. These are the words now of Abigail to David. David is madder than a hornet, and he's getting ready to go and take out Nabal and every other man that is a part of that household uh, because uh, Nabal uh, insulted him and his men. And uh, he's saddled up with 400 of his men. And uh, they're getting ready to, to go and take Nabal out. And uh, they, they were well able to do it. We'll just say it that way. Um, but uh, Nabal's wife, Abigail, came out and began to intercede and began to reason with David. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee. In other words, she says to him, the Lord, and that all those capitals, that's the Lord, Jehovah God. And she says, my Lord, a small l, that's referring to David. But that L-O-R-D where it's all capitalized, she's referring to Lord uh, God Jehovah. She said, he's got so many plans for you and so many good things that he wants to do. When the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee, and thou, sh thou have appointed thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. She's acknowledging that you're going to be king one day. You're not, just a, you're not just a fugitive running from justice. God has his hand on your life. Thank the Lord for good friends that sometimes step into your life and give you the proper perspective on something. You're not what the enemy is trying to identify you as. Verse 31, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. Remember what I have told you. David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. One thing about David, and I think this is why God loved him so much, it wasn't that he was flawless. He was a human being, and he had emotions and didn't always respond the right way. But he was quick to acknowledge when he needed to adjust his feelings. He was quick to ask for repentance when he fell into adultery. And when Abigail approaches him and says, God's got bigger plans for you. Don't let this thing be laid to your cause. It's not worth it. How many of you know you got to pick your battles sometimes? And he said, you're right. The Lord has sent you. This is of God. And blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou which hath kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. Free from footholds. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Footholds. What are footholds? Well, I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but have you ever tried to get into an elevator that was really aggressive and you were, it opened and the bell didn't ring very loud. And by the time you noticed that that was the one that was over there that was open, 
and you got your bags and you tried to get over there to it, the thing was trying to shut again. So what do we do? Now, I would not suggest this in older elevators because older elevators will just chop off your foot. They don't care. But the newer ones have all these sensors and, of course, with liability and the attorneys and everything involved, they have all these things where if somebody can get their hand or their foot in the middle of that door between those two areas that are closing, it will stop and back up. And so I'll be the first to admit that there's been times that I haven't had the chance to, I just get my foot stuck in the middle. And fortunately, it's one of those newer elevators that doesn't chop off the foot and the doors will open back up again. Well, that's the same thing that we're talking about today when we talk about footholds. Sometimes the enemy just wants to get a foot in the door. You've been in church for a while. He knows he's not going to convince you to go out and be some sort of a whoremonger. He's not going to convince you to go out and, and become a drug addict. He's just going to try to get a foothold in your life. And it is important to recognize that footholds can be so destructive. And the reason that they can be so destructive is that they look so innocent at first. In fact, we've even got a good name for being angry. We call it righteous indignation. It sounds spiritual, doesn't it? You know, the other day, my son um, said to me, uh, he said, Dad, I'm really concerned about Mom. And I said, why? He said, she drives angry. <laughs> and she explained that it was just righteous indignation about somebody hogging the left lane. But footholds are small things that begin to lodge in our spirit. And it starts with an offense. Somebody offended us. Somebody got our parking spot. Somebody got our seat. Somebody didn't say hello in the foyer. Somebody didn't send your kid a graduation gift. Somebody forgot your birthday. Oh my goodness, how many offenses are there? There can be so many. And if we're not careful, we can allow an offense to become a foothold. And then a foothold can become a stronghold. And a stronghold can become a mountain. And before you know it, you don't have your joy anymore. You're not excited about going to church anymore. You don't even know if you want to talk to the Lord in the morning in your daily devotion anymore. Because a foothold has allowed the enemy to get into our spirit and to cause what God has intended to give us, uh, the joy of the Lord is my strength, to uh, cause all of that to evaporate. But oh, my friend, if you can learn how to be free from the foothold, uh, to not even allow the enemy to get a foot in the door of your life or your spirit, hallelujah, but say, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to come to the house of God, and I'm going to rejoice. Yeah. Hallelujah. So... What is it that causes us to allow these footholds to get a place uh, in our life? Well, first of all, understand this, that if you can win the battles, you can win the war. Uh, people don't just lose their salvation overnight. It's usually a process of time. And so the key is to go back and to deal with things while they're still small. If you can learn how to deal with things while they're still minuscule, they're much easier to deal with. When they metastasize into something much bigger, it becomes uh, much uh, harder to deal with. And David knew the danger in this. Is this why he was always trying to protect his spirit? This is why he wouldn't even cut off part of the robe of King Saul, even though King Saul was chasing him and he was hiding in a cave. And it just so happened that King Saul came into that cave to rest. And David was hiding in the inner part of that cave with all of his men. He could have easily gone out there and taken uh, Saul out, but he didn't. And he says later, hey, I could have killed you, but I didn't. You know, you'd think he'd say, I appreciate that, David. I'm going home. I'll never chase you again. Thank you so much for your kindness and mercy. But no, when people aren't right with God, they're just going to keep on that path. But guess what? you got to keep on doing the right thing. You, you doing the right thing can't be dependent on how they react or don't react to you doing the right thing. I'm doing the right thing because I want to be right with God. I don't need you to verify it. I don't need you to affirm me doing the right thing. You can go ahead and keep on treating me wrong. I'm going to keep on and doing the right thing because i got to protect my own spirit. This is, the, this is how David was, and this is why God loved David. This is why God used David. And so David knew the danger in this. And 
And that's why he protected his spirit from footholds. He wouldn't allow any offense to lodge in his spirit. So when Nabal refused, that, see, Nabal was a, was a rich man. The Bible said he had 3,000 sheep and had 1,000 goats. Now, that to you may not equate to wealth, but that was wealthy then. And so he had all of this there that was a part of uh, his wealth. And uh, this was a time whenever they went to shear the sheep. And that was kind of like when a farmer would go to harvest. It was a time that uh, all of that wealth was going to be able to uh, be paid off because that's when they made their money when they sheared all the sheep. So there was a, a lot of extra uh, shepherds that were brought in and people that were skilled at doing this. And, and David and his men were on the run. They were uh, individuals that had been removed from their families. Uh, they were people that were uh, sort of uh, in, in between. They weren't uh, at home. Uh, they weren't necessarily criminals per se, but they had either been falsely accused or they had fallen into debt or whatever the cause was, they were not uh, able to be at home. So they joined themselves to David, and they were all on the run. They were, uh, they were individuals that were, uh, you know, just like when you take a, a bear and uh, you start to, you know, see the little baby bear and the cub and you play with him and he looks so cute. That's very dangerous. Because that means that there's a mama nearby. And so you, you, you don't want to mess with uh, a person's kids. You don't want to mess with uh, people that have loved ones that are close to it. Because what happens is whenever you feel that your family is being threatened, you'll react very strongly to that. And, and a lot of these men were people whose uh, families had been done wrong. Or they had been falsely accused. And so they were... Uh, if I can say it this way, they were wounded bears. They, they, they were people that were looking for a fight. Right. However you want to say it. They had a chip on their shoulder. Right. And uh, you, 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 you put them all together. And, uh, I, I mean, they came and joined David because they recognized that David was being falsely accused and the king was chasing him because he was jealous of David's popularity. And they said, hey, we can relate to that. You know, we've been treated wrong too. And uh, they joined together. There were 600 of them. And you put all of these people together, 600 people that are mad and upset. I, I, I've always, I, I've shared this with you before, but for some reason, uh, I guess it's because it's totally opposite of me, but I love reading about Navy SEALs. And I, I guess maybe in, in, a, in, a, in some sort of a fantasy world, I think of myself as a Navy SEAL. And so... <laughs> with, which is the furthest. I mean, can you imagine if I got in one of those settings, I'd be all, I'd be history. But I'm fascinated with these people that can overcome these obstacles and all that. Well, so I started reading all these different books about Navy SEALs and, and, and what formulates them and all this and this and that. Da, da, da. You know what I found out? There was a common denominator in all of these Navy SEALs. I mean, even some of the ones, you know, uh, Marcus Luttrell, the, well, the ones that became uh, known through the different books that were written and whatnot. Uh, th there was this common denominator. And the common denominator were all of them had a chip on their shoulder. All of them had daddy issues. All of them were angry. And so the wonderful U.S. military has come together and provided a way for you to be angry. <laughs> Legally. This is, this is why Mike Tyson was such, a, was such a, a brawler, because he had a chip on his shoulder. And that, that guy that trained him, I can't remember his name, he's passed on now. But the guy that trained him, he found him as a kid, you know, up there and somewhere in the Bronx. And he said, hey, I can make this guy into a, a knockout machine. And so they find a way to, to harness all of that uh, anger and all of that resentment and, and to use it effectively. And so they, they make boxers or they make Navy SEALs or all of this and that. Here's what God wants to do. God's not wanting to harness your anger. God wants to give you peace in the midst of the storm. I don't know. None of this is in my notes, but I feel it in the Holy Ghost. You may have daddy issues, but you've got a heavenly father, hallelujah, who will never leave you nor forsake you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. And he loves you, and he desires to do a work in your life. You don't have to live angry. You don't have to live upset. You don't have to live with all of these emotions that want you to self-destruct. He wants to put his arms of love around you. 
And so here's these group of men. I mean, they, they, and, and they didn't even know Nabal, but they were out there and they, they, were, they protected his flocks. They didn't steal from them. They didn't uh, hurt them. And they even protected them. And so they were hungry and it came time to get something to eat. And they sent word, David sent word through 10 of his young men to go to Nabal and say, hey, we've, you know, we've been good to all your herds and shepherds out here. And you, you know, it's been a time of shearing the sheep. And so we were wondering if you could just, you know, spare a little bit for us so that we could eat dinner tonight and all of that. And uh, Nabal, he just, he just insulted he said, I don't know who this David is, and I don't know who Jesse is, his dad. And I don't, there's been a lot of servants that are misplaced from their masters. And who knows? I don't know why he, he's been, you know, out here set aside from his family and his father and the kingdom. But why should I encourage that? Why should I feed that? Uh, get off my property. And uh, so uh, Nabal, being a stingy old rich guy, he didn't want to help anybody. And so word got back to David. And uh, David, he didn't even say anything. He just turned to 400 of his men and said, put your sword on. We're getting ready to ride. 200 of them, you're going to stay here and watch the, uh, the stuff, and 400 of us are going to go take care of business. And so, boy, they all got up, and they all had their sword on, and they were ready to go. Boy, I'm going to tell you one thing. This is something else I feel like saying. Sometimes it's good to just sleep on something. <laughs> I'm just going to be real with you tonight or today. It's important sometimes to just sleep on something. Have you ever written an email, you were really upset with somebody, and you wrote a scalding email, and you just wrote it, and there was smoke coming off the keys? <laughs> And you write a whole email, and you get done, and you read that thing, and you feel better about yourself. But before you hit sin, you say, I'm going to just sleep on it. I'm going to pray about it. And you start to pray about it, and you start to think about it. And what do you do? You hit the delete button. Now, some of you don't hit the delete button. You hit the save button because you wrote it so well. You don't want to waste all that anger? <laughs> there may be a time in the future you can use it. Just change the name at the top. No, don't do that. Delete it. Because the Lord will give you wisdom. He'll give you the right spirit. He'll say, hey, go ahead. Let God fight your battles. There's no reason for you to go on record. God's got too many good things for you. God's got a future for you. God's got something that's going to cause your life to be changed. Don't waste it. Madison, I don't know if you all are interested in history, but Madison, or was it Hamilton? It was Hamilton. Hamilton got into a, a, one of the founding fathers. He got into a skirmish with, I think his name was Aaron Burr. Is that right? And Aaron Burr was a fighter. He just always looking for a fight. There's some people that just want to fight all the time about everything and uh they got into some skirmish and something was said in public and got and got put into the newspaper and all that and uh aaron burr challenged hamilton to a duel and the friends came up to hamilton and said don't do it don't get into a duel with aaron burr he said why not i'm gonna put an end to this i'm tired of dealing with his mouth and uh they said no here's why you don't need to mess with him hamilton because he is ready to die and you're not. So even if you wrestle with a pig, you're going to get dirty. And the pig is too, but the pig likes it. He lives in the slop. There ain't no reason for you to be drugged down in all of that. And Hamilton ignored the advice and was killed in the duel. He didn't have to be. Because he entangled himself with somebody who was ready to die who had nothing to lose. Let me tell you something. Don't engage with somebody who has nothing to lose and you have nothing to gain from it. Say, I'm going to set my sights ahead. 
I'm not going to worry about it. I ain't going to get offended. If I get offended, it'll turn into a foothold, and that foothold's going to steal my joy, and the devil's going to fan the fuel and the fire and try to make it like something that it's not. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stop and begin to rejoice in the Lord. I'm not going to let an offense become a foothold. Now, here's where David benefited. He benefited from having a friend who came and just told him like it was. He didn't even know that Abigail was a friend, but she was. So when you have people that you know have your best interest at heart, then you need to listen to them. Don't give the devil a foothold. Because if you've got godly counsel, that is more reliable than your emotions. Because your emotions will play tricks on you. There's a lot of things you feel that are not real. They feel real, but they're not real. It's based on your perspective, your emotions, the, 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 the offense that you feel in your own spirit. And you can say, I know she meant that. I know he meant that. That's why she hadn't returned my casserole dish. I know what she's after. She's upset because she's still mad that I got that dress and wore it on Easter Sunday, and she wanted to wear it on Easter Sunday. And I know what she's trying to get at. And I'm just going to just pray that God will deal with her and her husband. Don't make it a spiritual thing. There ain't nothing spiritual about none of that. You got to get over some stuff. You got to get your joy back. You got to get your song back. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Now, here's, here's what we know. Small things are often more dangerous than big things. And you say, how can that be, Pastor? And here's why. Because small things can get in through small openings. Small things can get in through small openings. Uh, something that is small can be very destructive. A small leak may sink a great ship. A trifling escape of gas, if neglected, can blow up a house. A little outburst of temper, a little provocation, words and acts out of anger have destroyed many a family and many of relationships. Something so small. And I'm sure that David was offended because he had been offended before. I'm sure David was offended when he was not invited to the house when the prophet Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be a king and they brought all the other brothers up into the house and they all said any one of these would be the next king. But nobody bothered even inviting David. I'm sure he was a human being that David was troubled by that. Now, this is why I believe Samuel, who was being used of God, and God said, it's not any of these guys. And he says to Jesse, you got any more sons? And Jesse said, uh, oh, yeah, almost forgot. David, but he's just a shepherd. He's young, and he's out there with the sheep and all that. But, yeah, he's basically a servant. Don't worry about him. And here's what Samuel said. No, I want you to call him. And none of us are going to sit down until he gets there. Woo! Samuel knew the next king was on his way. You can't judge a book by its cover. You don't know what God's doing in a person's life. You may look at somebody and say, they are a disaster. You don't know what God's got planned for them. He's going to use them for the kingdom. Hallelujah. He's got a calling and a destiny, and you can't rule them out. And David arrives at the house and everybody's standing. And he's like, uh-oh, this must mean trouble. And then Samuel anoints him. See, if you just keep on doing the right thing, God will level the playing field. He keeps good books. And then later on, I'm sure he was offended when his brothers mocked him as he questioned their reluctance to send a man to fight Goliath in the Valley of Elah when the armies of Israel were in array against the armies of the Philistines. And this Goliath, this giant of a man, was coming out. Send me a man! This big, tall, almost 10 feet tall, this guy, he's never lost a battle. He had a spear. The Bible describes it was so heavy, it was the, the weight of a weaver's beam. You say, I don't know what a weaver's beam is. Okay, just a beam. It was heavy. It was heavy. And he wielded it like it was a pocket knife. And uh, he said, you just send me one man. There's no reason everybody to die. If I beat him, you guys will be slaves to the Philistines. And if he beats me, then the Philistines will be to you. And nobody was going to go fight. The Bible said all their knees were knocking together. They all run and hide in the tent. And David shows up with his little bag of cheese. He's on an errand from his dad to go down and look after your brothers. And he goes, hey, 
Who's this guy with the bad breath out there hollering and saying he needs somebody to fight? How come nobody's fighting? This is the Israeli army. Why is nobody out there fighting? And they're like, who do you think you are? Are you trying to come up here to embarrass us? I'm sure David was offended because his brothers mocked him as he questioned why in the world. I'm sure David was offended when his own king and his mentor, King Saul, threw a javelin at David as he was up there just playing the harp, trying to make Saul feel better because he had all these evil spirits that were coming around him. You know what the evil spirits were? It was because of his own flesh. It was because of his own jealousy. It was because of his own insecurity, because he wasn't right with God. So they had to bring somebody in to play some music and calm his soul, and it was David. It wasn't just his music. It was because the Spirit of God was upon David. I'm going to tell you what, people. There is a world that is hungry for the anointing that we feel in the house of God. That's why they want Pentecostals to come and sing. That's why they've had them sing for presidential inaugurations. Uh, that's why they bring young people out of apostolic churches to sing in these mega churches in Texas. You know why? Because they're hungry for the anointing. It's not just your talent. It's not just your gift. It's not just your ability. It's because God is upon your life. Oh, we better never forget it's because of the goodness of God that we're even where we are. If it had not been for Jesus, where would we be? So David had been offended before. So how did David not allow these offenses to become footholds? How did he stop small things from becoming big things? I believe there is a pattern that we can follow. And I want to give three things to you that... I believe David did and how he responded to insults and offenses that caused him to be able to totally shut the door on a foothold, to close it out, to not allow the enemy to get a foothold in his spirit. First of all, David did not allow the rejection of family to affect his sense of responsibility. He didn't allow the rejection of family or friends to affect his sense of responsibility. In the case of not being invited to the house with Samuel, and even in the case of bringing you know, the lunch down to his brothers and his brothers mocking him and all of that, telling him to go home, and you got sheep back there that are waiting on you and all of that. When you look at those two examples, in both cases, David was very careful to make sure that his sheep were taken care of. He did not neglect them even though he had been rejected. He still took care of business. He was still responsible. The Bible says that he found someone to be a keeper of the sheep. Even before he left to run those errands for his dad, he made sure there was somebody there of responsibility that was going to take care of the sheep because he took his role as a shepherd, as a responsibility, and it didn't matter even though he was offended. It didn't matter that even family members were insulting him. He was still going to look after the sheep. Sometimes it's easy for us in our flesh to get offended and abandon our spiritual responsibilities. Can I tell you that God has called us to be a worshiper? So you got to worship God even though people have offended you. you got to take the responsibility of being a worshiper of God and say, I'm going to bless the Lord any how God has called us with a responsibility to be a soul winner and to share our testimony and to teach a Bible study and to share the goodness of the Lord guess what it doesn't matter who offends you it doesn't matter who treats you wrong it doesn't matter who doesn't invite you to their party you say hey I'm still going to be a witness for the name of Jesus Christ that's how you eliminate foothold and I don't think I'm going to go to church this week because I got offended last week. That's like the story I heard about the man that didn't want to go to church. And his wife said, you need to go to church. He said, I'm not going to church. Nobody down there likes me. And she said, that's not true. I don't know why you say that. He goes, I know for a fact it's true. Nobody at that church likes me, and they like you, but I'm not going to church down there. You give me three good reasons. She said, well, number one, your wife and your children are all going to church, and you ought to go with us. Number two... The people down there do like you. And number three, you're the pastor. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm going to pray this week because I got 
offended at something that the pastor said or something that the preacher said. No, that's how a foothold gets in. That's how the enemy can get his foot in the door. You've got to have one of them old-fashioned elevator doors. You've got to close the door on that foot. You've got to say, I'm not going to let the enemy get a foothold. I'm going to stay faithful to my calling. I'm going to stay committed to my assignment regardless of the offenses. This is what protects your spirit. Even to the point when David was offended by Saul, he still went out and fought Goliath. He still went out and destroyed the Philistines. Uh, Even though Saul wasn't right, even though Saul was hot on his trail, even though Saul was upset uh, because he saw him as a threat to the kingdom, guess what David did? He still served the kingdom. Oh, my friend, uh, if you want to be free from a foothold, uh, you got to say, hey, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stay faithful to my calling. I'm going to stay faithful to my assignment. Uh, God has brought me here for such a time as this, uh, and I'm going to make up in my mind, uh, I'm still going to be a praiser. I'm still going to be a worshiper. I'm still going to be a soul winner. I'm still going to be an encourager. I've got sheep to look after. Let me hurry. Number two, the next thing that we see is that David never stopped worshiping God, even though he had been done wrong. When Saul was trying to kill him, he kept on worshiping God. Look at Psalms 90, or, or, or Psalms chapter 9, verse 1. Psalms chapter 9 and verse 1. This is, this is a, a psalm of David. He said, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy wondrous works. I will be glad. Sometimes you've got to tell yourself to be glad. Sometimes you don't feel glad. you got to say, I will be glad. You woke up feeling sad. But you told yourself, I'm going to be glad. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Now watch verse 3. When mine enemies are turned back, which means they haven't turned back yet. They're still in hot pursuit. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou statest in the throne judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. Not only is David saying, uh, are his accusers and his enemies, uh, not only are they going to be destroyed, but there's not even going to be a memory of them. That's why the Bible says the name of the wicked shall rot. God's not even going to allow the wicked to have an inheritance. But the Lord shall endure forever. He said, I'm making up my mind. I'm going to be glad today. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. Uh, He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Uh, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, uh, a refuge in times of trouble, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Uh, For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them uh, that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord. David said, I got a right. I found a reason. I'm going to keep on singing. Sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Come on. You got to keep singing. You got to sing in a dry and thirsty place. You got to sing loud. You've got to sing strong. This is the day the Lord hath made. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Does that mean you've had a perfect week? No. You've had offenses. You've had trials. You've had troubles. But you still got a song. And you still got a praise. The enemy cannot get a foothold in the heart of a worshiper. Then look at Psalms 18. The intro to this psalm says that when David wrote this psalm, it was his song in the day that God delivered him from the hand of Saul. So Psalms 18.1 said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God and my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. 
The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. But in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him, even in his ears. This is after he's been delivered. You notice the difference. After he's delivered, he's praising God for the deliverance. But in the midst of it, before he was delivered, he said, I'm going to serve God through worship and through praise. I don't know when God's going to do it. I don't know how God's going to do it. But I'm going to go ahead and start praising him now. Because it don't matter if it's during, before, or after. Keep worshiping. Keep singing. An offense will struggle to become a foothold if you just keep on singing, if you just keep on worshiping the Lord, if you just keep on saying, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. If you say, I got a song in my heart and I'm not going to let Nabal steal it. I'm not going to let the offense or the rudeness of anybody else steal my joy. God has been too good to me. <laughs> Woo! Keep on worshiping. David could have been offended. He could have gone up with his men and taken out Nabal and all of his whole house. They, they weren't kind to him. David said that we were good to him and he returned to evil for good. Absolutely. There's people in life that are going to do that. You were good. You were good to that company, that employer. And they treated you like dirt. But they don't have the final say. God has the final say. And God is going to bless you. There's companies that are getting rid of apostolic Pentecostals because they've bought into wokeness and all of this junk and all this transgender garbage. And they don't want you working there because you don't line up with their philosophies. A young girl in our church was fired after she worked faithfully for a company in this town. But because she wasn't full of wokeness and full of all this idolatry and debauchery that's going on in our society, they said, you don't fit here anymore. Well, guess what? God gave her an even better job, making more money. God's going to have the final say. You keep on working hard. You keep on being a good employee. You keep on saying, I'm going to bless the Lord anyhow. Oh, you may not think this is spiritual, but this is real life. This is where we live day to day. I'm going to tell you something. God's not only going to bless you in your future. God's going to bless you in your present. Because if you just turn things over to God, God can take care of it and do a better job at it than you can do. David said, you're right, I'm walking away. And that very night, Nabal died of a heart attack. That very night, he died of a heart attack. He was all full of wine and drank himself to death. And they sent word to David and said, Nabal is dead. And you know what David said? Send for Abigail. <laughs> David got a wife out of the whole thing. Some of y'all looking for spouses and think you got to move across the country to find a spouse. Can I tell you, if you just stay faithful in the work of God, God will bring you the right person at the right time. And it'll come from the most unexpected areas. All you got to do is keep on worshiping God. All you got to do is keep on being faithful to your assignment. God's got blessings for you, untold blessings. That was for free. I just threw that in. I got to hurry. To say that David was furious is an understatement. He's livid. But he said, guess what? I'm going to follow God's plan. I'm not going to allow a foothold to get in my life. He shows mercy. He shows compassion. He's kind. If you'll let God fight your battles, you'll protect your own spirit God will take care of it. And when he does, he's going to give you a bonus for taking your hands off of it. Here's the third thing. If you'll show mercy and compassion, 
he will protect you from an offense becoming a foothold. In the New Testament, the book of James shows how a similar process works when the enemy tries to destroy and trap us. James 1.14, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Tempted, drawn away, enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's a process. Just like we said before, a fence becomes a foothold. A foothold becomes a stronghold. A stronghold becomes a mountain. This, James is saying, is a similar process in that we get tempted, we're drawn away, we're enticed, and then that lust, when it's conceived, when it metastasizes, it brings forth sin, it grows, and then sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Jesus. You ought to stand to your feet right now and begin to thank the Lord for that message. The Lord saying, I am your victory. Oh, you ought to thank the Lord right now. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're my strength, Lord. You're my victory. Hallelujah. Come on, you ought to run to this altar. God's got an oasis for you in the midst of a desert. God's got joy. Every good gift cometh from the Father above. He wants to fill you with joy. He wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Come on, lay every offense on the altar. Leave it here. Get your song back. In the name of Jesus. Come on, be set free in the name of Jesus. That's it, worship until you're free. Worship until you get your victory back. I am free by the blood of Jesus. Shut the rabbit high up. 